bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. I thank you, loving Lord, for your grace. Thank you for the privilege of studying your word and for advancing spiritually because of the application of that word to our lives. As we study a passage which becomes a warning to all believers that him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. May each of us be prepared to uh, be attacked in the very area that the Galatians were attacked, and may our own uh, spirits be strengthened in the inner man by doctrine and the filling of the Holy Spirit, that we not become casualties in the angelic conflict. And to that end, I set aside this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I'm going to pass a rule. No popping corn before class unless you have some for all of us. <laughs> I just said I, I think. I think. I didn't say I would, but I moved in that direction. <laughs> Ronald Reagan in his biography tells about the only time that you can get away as president, because especially after the attack on his life, the attempt on his life, was when he could go up to uh, Camp David, and uh, which is isolated, and uh, then he, he, but he's never alone. There, Secret Service men and staff people and all the rest, but he said what they loved to do was to on Saturday night was to gather in the big room, pop big bowls of popcorn, and sit and watch old movies. Some of which even starred people by the name of Reagan and Davis. <laughs> but uh, well, we're studying Galatians chapter one, and we have uh, we're, we uh, uh, began looking. Uh, at chapter 1, verse 6, we completed that uh, and moved into to verse 7 in our last study. But we do want to, to just review the one word where the Apostle Paul says this. This is the translation of Galatians 1, 6. I am absolutely amazed that you so readily, so rashly, are defecting from the one who called you by the grace of Christ to another gospel which is not another. And we talked about it, but it's going to come up again in the passage before us. The two words for another, uh, one looks like this in the Greek, H-E-T-E-R-O-S, and the other looks like this. A-L-L-O-S. Heteros and alas. Heteros denotes a qualitative difference. Alas, a numerical difference. Heteros distinguishes one of two. Alas adds one besides every heteros is an alas, but not every alas is a heteros. Furthermore, heteros not only involves the idea of difference of kind, while alas simply makes a distinction of individuals, heteros uh, often refers not only to difference in kind, but speaks to the fact that the character of that thing which is different is evil or bad. That is, the fact that something differs in kind from something else makes the thing to be an, of an evil character. And so when Paul says that uh, you are defecting, uh, we, we know what it means to be a defector. We studied the word in detail. 
a, defect, a defector from uh, the one who called you by the grace of Christ to another gospel. That's the first word that he uses, heteros, indicating uh, of another of a different kind and that the character of that different kind is evil or bad. And then he goes on to say, which is not another of the same kind, another alas. And we went into that uh, in, in detail because it's going to come up uh, again in the passage which is before us. We also studied first uh, 2 Corinthians 11.4, which uh, de de uses both terms uh, uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, we are now, uh, we have finished up uh, by uh, pointing out that there is a great deal of defection. There are two sides to, to the criticisms that are, that are given to us in this passage. First, you have the teachers who are false. Secondly, you have the people who are swallowing the false doctrine. And both of these are uh, at fault. Uh, now, Paul can't do much about the false teachers, but he can about the people who are swallowing the falsehoods. And uh, uh, he begins then by talking to the people. And he says, I am amazed that you, so readily, so rashly, are defecting. They are following these false teachers from the one who called you by the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And that different gospel, he says, is no gospel at all. Now, the seven, uh, Galatians 1, 7b continues with these words uh, in which he says, Evidently, uh, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Uh, this uh, portion of the verse begins with the uh, particle I, E-I, plus the subjective negative may. I may. Uh, J.B. Lightfoot points out that I may in the Greek is both acceptive and a positive. And he thus translates this, only in this sense is it another gospel in that it is an attempt to pervert the one true gospel. And while that is the sense, it's a paraphrase rather than a translation. Now, you recognize uh, uh, two things. First of all, the A is uh, a conditional particle. And it is a conditional particle which uh, is used to begin the prothesis of a first-class condition in the Greek. Now, uh, ordinarily, a uh, the, remember the, first, the conditional clauses have a prothesis and an apothesis. The prothesis sets forth the condition, and uh, the apothesis uh, uh, sets forth the result. Now, however, uh, and not, not always uh, uh, do you have the whole thing completed. And so uh, this, this particle in the first class condition is going to express uh, an intimation of something which is in reality taking place. So, uh, uh, really what he is saying is uh, going to be this. Since, as the case may be. Now, we're taking the negative, uh, we're making a positive out of it because of uh, the way it's going to work. In English and the, the Greek, it doesn't permit us to actually transliterate it, or uh, translate it strictly from the Greek to the English. We're going to have to move it from a negative to a positive, as you'll see how it works out. And we begin then with, since as the case may be, then we have the verb of absolute status quo, I me, in the present active indicative form. Now, the present tense uh, is uh, the present tense of duration. It is something which is continuing. It's going on even at this time. The active voice, the subject produces the action of the verb, the subject, in this case, are the false teachers. 
they are producing the uh, the action and the indicative mood is the reality of the fact that these false teachers are continuing to perform what they uh, would be doing all the time and that is they are so we begin since as the case may be there are or there keep on being a translation of the this verb and then we have what they're doing described in the present active participle and that's going to change the way it's translated the verb the is uh, that is from which the participle comes is this word t a r a s s o tarasso now tarasso means to agitate it means to trouble it means to put into consternation it means to disquiet or unsettle it means to perplex now this is preceded by the definite article which is very often the case in a participle and the definite article therefore is used as a pronoun translated ones very often and then the ones doing something described in the verbal adjective see now uh, uh, so we have uh, the definite article with the participle is going to tell us that this word terrasso uh, describes the fact that these people are characteristically this is what this this is a character uh, a, a, a trait they are characteristically uh, doing this again the present tense is uh, for a condition which is constantly going on it's the character of their lives and so we are saying this that uh, in order to translate it correctly since as the case may be there are some the troublemakers unsettling you I'm translating it unsettling but I'm taking the ones as uh, 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 the, the troublemakers so I'm putting them together and making the, the, the translation to say that uh, the, uh, the the troublemakers unsettling you so that we get the whole idea as that uh, they were agitating, unsettling, disturbing mentally the believers in the churches of Galatia. Since, as the case may be, there are some, the troublemakers, unsettling you. Now, what are the unsettling ones? Uh, what, is, what is underneath everything? Well, we have the, the word which describes their whole uh, life it looks like this T H E L O fellow is a will which proceeds from the emotions there here are people whose will from the emotions therefore desire is not a bad translation uh, their purpose would be another they have this for the purpose of their life the purpose of their life the desire of their life is to present active participle again from this time uh, from uh, meta strefo looks like this m e t a s t r e p h o now metastrepho means to turn around or to convert something uh, to something else to change to the opposite uh, pardon me this is not a participle it's an infinitive I should have I may have made a mistake in writing it down this is an infinitive now the infinitive always denotes either a result or purpose in this case it's the purpose of their life goes along with the desire the desire of their life is given in the purpose and what is their purpose their purpose is 
to uh, pervert the gospel. Present tense, again, is durative. It, it, this is the purpose of their entire lives. They never change their purpose. It is always the same. They always want to uh, pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the infinitive indicates that uh, uh, this, this, this characterizes their lives at all times. They would make it a message of works instead of a message of grace. Uh, they would make it a message of salvation by faith plus some kind of human merit. It wasn't just enough for them to derange the meaning or to turn aside its true meaning. It was actually their purpose to, to convert or transform the gospel into something diametrically opposite of that which was God's purpose. God's tremendous purpose is to give the gospel uh, without any kind of human involvement. Their purpose is to interject human involvement. The gospel of Christ refers to the good news which emanates from the Lord Jesus Christ and which he has entrusted to the apostle to communicate. So, uh, this translation says this, uh, I am absolutely amazed that you so readily so rashly are defecting from the one who called you by the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not the gospel at all since as the case may be there are some the troublemakers unsettling you desiring to pervert the gospel of Christ and they're going to be with us always beloved I, Again and again, as you go through the New Testament, you are absolutely amazed. Uh, remember when we studied the setting for the book of Galatians. We studied Paul's first missionary journey. And no sooner had he and Barnabas got to the island of Cyprus when they were confronted with the false communication of the gospel. The false prophet Bar-Jesus, son of Jesus, comes along and perverts the gospel. Paul's life it was characterized by the legalizers trailing him wherever he went. Back at the turn of the century, some of the atheists made it a point to follow the gospel evangelists into towns where they would have meetings. And these, these atheists would rent halls similar to the meeting halls of the evangelists and would uh, speak on the subject uh, of, uh, of their atheism in, right after the evangelists had come in to uh, communicate the gospel. And Moody uh, was uh, uh, hounded by them. Uh, uh, Dwight L. Moody, wherever he went, they were not far behind. And they would uh, get in and they would say, well, now you have heard uh, the message of Dwight Moody about a God, and I am here to tell you that there is no God, and I'm going to prove it to you right now. I'm going to make it so obvious that there will not be a person to leave this room who will not uh, believe there is no God as soon as I'm finished. And then he would stop and stand and would look up to heaven and say, If there is a God, I challenge him to strike me dead right now. And since God didn't do it, they said, See, if there was a God, he'd do it. Since there is no God, he didn't do it, there is no God. And so the idea was to immediately confuse, to snatch, to pervert, to, to, to step uh, in front. Now, that type of, of confrontation hasn't been around for a long, long time. They're a little more insidious these days, but they are there. Uh, Bill was telling me before class about a, a television program on Saturday morning. Glenn, what's the name of it? Do you know which one we're talking about? Huh? He said you watched it with him, so. Oh, it's it's a well. I'm mean, I'll tell you about the incarnate reincarnation, the one where they cut off the heads. Do you remember that? Yeah, the Highlander. That's what it is. The Highlander. It's a program in which uh, there, there, there's no problem. It's on Saturday morning when all the kids are watching, and it's a continuing series. Bill said, and the point of this program is that this man is has, is the is reincarnated, and he every time he he uh, kills someone, he receives the power and the intelligence and everything that they had sucks up into his body. And if he cuts off their head, they're dead permanently. But if he just kills them, 
there's no problem because they'll be re reincarnated uh, again in another generation. So uh, killing people isn't bad just so you don't cut off their heads. And you only cut off the heads of the bad guys. I mean, doesn't that sound right? I mean, uh, but this kind of stuff is, along with so many of the other junk that's on uh, El Tubo, the poison, Hollywood poison, is, is being pumped out consistently in, in an insidious way, in an insidious way. To pervert the gospel, but uh, there are so many other ways that the gospel is 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 uh, perverted. Uh, it's perverted by people who don't know what the gospel is. They are ignorant of what the true gospel is. They've heard somebody say something or do something, or dear old doctor so and so has done, and they've just perpetuated his error. Now Paul begins in verse eight to to make a, a, a statement that is that is almost uh, uh, unbelievable. In verse 8, he suggests a hypothetical situation. And then in verse 9, although it appears to be kind of a simple repetition of verse 8, it is not. It is an advance on that hypothetical situation to something which is not hypothetical, but is actually going on. You'll see it from the translation of one particle that makes a world of difference. He begins with a strong adversative conjunction, Allah. A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, and he describes a, uh, the, uh, he describes a condition which, is, uh, with the uh, part of the, the conditional particle, aon, E-A-N, and uh, this is a third class condition, if in a third class condition, but uh, uh, when you uh, connect it with the chi, the, con uh, the conjunction, okay, you come up with a translation but even though it is if, but but it's stronger than that. It's even though. Okay, now he uses the nominative first person plural of the personal pronoun pronoun ego, e g o, and this in which Paul joins himself to with uh, his other colleagues, those who have. Uh, communicated the gospel uh, to the Galatians previously. And uh, when he says we, he's referring to himself, but not only to himself, but to those who had been with him on that uh, journey, Barnabas, and uh, the others who were associated with him. Uh, and, and by using this, he's pointing out something, that this is not a controversy between one Bible teacher and another over some insignificant uh, subpoint. This is between truth and error. That's where the controversy really lies in this passage. Now he says, even, th but even though we are an angel from heaven. Now let's stop for a moment here. You know that the word angel. Uh, looks like this in the Greek, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. And the two G's, uh, when they're put together, sound like N-G in the Greek, so it's angelos. Now, not only did uh, the King James uh, translators make this mistake, but so did the New International translators make this mistake, and the New American Standard made this mistake. And here's why it's a mistake. Because never anywhere in Scripture has the communication of the gospel ever, ever been entrusted to an angel. It has never been given to an angel to communicate the gospel. But angel doesn't mean angel. Angel is a transliteration of angelos. What is the translation of angelos? The word is messenger. That's what the word actually means. That's the translation. And Paul isn't saying, even though we are an angel from heaven, he is saying this, even though we are a messenger from heaven. Keep your finger here for just a moment and look back with me to Acts 14. We have already studied it, but it's important. We looked it over very quickly. We didn't look at, uh, at it in detail. I just referred to it. But in Acts chapter 14, when the Apostle Paul 
uh, on his first missionary journey, comes to Lystra. In Lystra, he communicates the gospel, and he heals a lame man who was uh, lame from birth and had never walked. And Paul uh, uh, looks at him, and he says, Stand up on your feet. The man jumped up and began to walk. Now, verse 11, Acts 14, 11. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Laconian language, quote, This is what they said. The gods have come down to us in human form. What are the gods? A messenger from heaven. They thought that Paul and Barnabas were messengers from heaven. Verse 12. Barnabas they called Zeus, the head god, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Uh, verse 13. The prince, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So, you see, the, uh, because they had done a miracle, the conclusion of the people, then the Galatian people, was that they were messengers from heaven. They were looking at the evidence of a miracle, and seeing the miracle, they concluded that the miracle worker was had to be a god or a messenger from heaven. And verse 14 and following, uh, Paul, uh, when, they, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes, rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven and earth and so forth. And so he straightens out the, the situation. But he, what I'm saying is that Paul is saying, Look, when I first came to you, you thought I was a God or a messenger from heaven because of the miracle. Now suppose somebody comes and perform some miracle in your midst. Are you going to believe? And then they give you a gospel that's different. Uh, uh, another of a different kind of a gospel. Uh, are you going to believe this false gospel because it is attested to by some kind of a miracle? And so he is really saying this. He is saying that uh, suppose someone should arrive uh, at your, uh, in your city at some time or another. And this person, uh, suppose I come back, and we'll deal with that later, but this person should perform some kind of a miracle. Uh, would you think that that person is a representative of the gods, and would you therefore hear and heed their message? So he says, but even though we are... Uh, or a messenger from heaven should preach. Now, the word preach is keruso, but that's not what the word is here. Keruso looks like this. Keruso. But this is not the word which is used here. The word which is used here is the aorist middle subjunctive of this word. E-U-A-G-G-E-L-I-Z-O. Now, we get our word evangelize from this. And the pre prefix E-U means good. Angelizo is message. It is the good message. Just like angelos was messenger, angelizo is a message. So it is the good message. But, you see, uh, to uh, it, the, the word means to announce the message of good news. So, uh, uh, we, uh, when Paul says this, is, but even though we, or a messenger from heaven, should announce a message of good news. Now let's get to this other word, even though we. It, it, would make, note, it should make no difference to these people who it is who has this message. It could be possible, says Paul, that I might somehow or other apostatize and I might come back and I might give to you a gospel which is different. I might announce good news to you which is different from the message that I have already given to you. Remember that there are all kinds of people out there 
who are in a teaching position, who are called upon to... Uh, uh, they are, they are the, uh, the uh, subject of vicious satanic attack all the time. And some people have their eyes always on the, uh, uh, something new, coming up with something new. It is a tremendous pressure on pastors to always come up with something new to titillate the congregation, to find something new and esoteric, something that's different, and to, as to, to uh, titillate the congregation. And we always have people who are, quote-unquote, rethinking uh, this certain message. And then they'll come back with something new. Uh, I uh, was uh, reading a communique that came today from uh, somebody, and uh, they said... Uh, that uh, while we believe in the uh, imminent rapture, nevertheless, when the recent Jewish holiday, Rosh Hashanah, came, we gathered our family together and we sat in our family room and we sang hymns because that we thought maybe that was the date of the rapture of the church. Now, what a way to have your foot in both camps, you know. Uh, we believe in the imminent, but, but we thought this would be the, uh, that the, the Lord is coming on Rosh Hashanah because yeah, cause the other uh, events in his life were simultaneous with other Jewish feasts. Uh, the uh, uh, Passover, the sacrifice, the uh, Pentecost, uh, and uh, the first fruits, and so all of this is related to, fruit, uh, to the feast. Therefore, the rapture has to take place uh, in relationship to one of the Jewish feasts. Such heresy. The rapture has nothing to do with anything on the Jewish calendar. Never has, never will have. The rapture is a signless and timeless event. And But but I thought, well, somebody got through to them. Somebody sent them something, and here they sat with their family singing hymns in case the Lord would come. And that week before, they spent thinking on spiritual things, getting all things read, read, making sure they were right with everybody on, on the face of the earth. Now, beloved, there's no grace in that. It's all getting yourself, you know, it's all work, and it's all heresy. But people are always thinking about it. The first great problem they ever had at Tulsa Seminary was when a, a young uh, uh, pastor who was a graduate of Dallas rethought the rapture generation, like as if he was the first one to come up with the idea that you cannot know when the rapture is going to take place, but you can know what generation he's coming in. And if all the signs of the generation are there, then and, you're, and it's your generation, then you know. And so he was teaching at the seminary, the rapture generation, we are in the rapture generation. And... Uh, at that time, I was just, uh, you know, no, I, no, not connected with the seminary in any way, but I knew the, the, the president, and I really raised Cain over that. And uh, uh, though uh, Jack was a very fine man and a good communicator, he was wrong. He got screwed up. Now, that's not another gospel, I recognize, but it's, it's illustrative of the fact that these things are happening all the time. People are rethinking former positions. Uh, and uh, they are uh, coming up with something new all the time. Uh, and I'm amazed how readily they are accepted. I have read at least a half a dozen errors in Tony Campolo's theology, and yet today he's one of the most popular speakers, and he's heard on WBCL. He's picked up by almost everybody and followed hook, line, and stinker right down the line. And his heresy as far as atonement is concerned, heresy regarding uh, the rapture is concerned, all kinds of things that are wrong. And yet all you have to do is say I have a Baptist background and everybody accept whatever you're saying and get a couple of books published and they follow whatever you say, hook, line, and sink. Just take it and, and run with it, you know. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. How many of these false teachers have, quote, had their eyes open? You know. Uh, I, I just didn't understand these things. And they get involved in heterodoxy rather than following orthodoxy. And Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Everything has already somewhere along the line come out. Believe it or not. I mean, 
whatever the, the theology is. It's been out there somewhere or other. Someone has taught it. Me, you maybe just don't know about it. And I, I get a kick out of those people in the rapture generation. They just haven't lived long enough, that's all. Because I go back to the time in which uh, people had great big charts that would run 17, 20 feet long. They'd come to a church and put it up and, and, and go through the, the various things, and all the people sat with mouth wide open as they would say, and now we are 200 yards from the rapture of the church. And what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, the point is that the Jews have now taken uh, old Jeru uh, New Jerusalem, but they, they don't have uh, the old city of Jerusalem. And between old city of Jerusalem and the new city of Jerusalem, there's a, a 200-yard no man's land. But let me tell you people, they would say, I'm not saying this, that's what they would say, that when the Jews move across from the new Jerusalem and take the old Jerusalem, the rapture of the church is at hand because the Bible says that uh, the Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And then the, 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 the rapture is coming for sure. And I, I, I just picture some of those guys uh, saying, and I've heard them, I, I attended some of the, 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 the sessions. They made stupid statements, ridiculous statements that do not hold water. Stick with the Scripture. Stick with what thus saith the Lord. There are all kinds of people who come up with all kinds of ideas that have been going around for years and years and years and years. And there's always somebody, and it always sounds new to somebody, but it's not new. It's been going around for years and years. All kinds of conspiracy theories that uh, have been uh, thrown around by people who are in the know, and they, they take news events and they fit them into certain uh, categories and come up with some kind of a conclusion that, well, the end of the world is near, or whatever it may be, or the gospel. Or they come back and say, well, I was wrong. And I mentioned the other day that there is actually a very large organization of former fundamentalists called Fundamentalists Anonymous, who used to be fundamentalists, who have turned their back on fundamentalism and are today the biggest critics of fundamentalism. When I say fundamentalism, I'm referring to those who believe the fundamentals of the faith, evangelicals, those who believe the Bible to be the inspired and errant word of God. But the, 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 the communicator has been given a message. And even though we, or a messenger from heaven, should announce a message of good news other than the one we proclaimed to you the first time, now, the word other is actually uh, uh, a Greek idiom from P-A-R-H-O, par-H-O. This is really para, but uh, be, be, you can't have two uh, vowels together. So the, the uh, uh, Greek word means contrary. Uh, the, the Greek idiom ma makes it means contrary. So when he says, he doesn't say other than the one we preach, but contrary to the one we preach to you. Now, uh, and it's going to be the same in verse 9. Translation would be this. But even though we, or a messenger from heaven, should announce a message of good news, contrary to the message of good news we announced to you, then he goes on to add a tremendous statement which is almost uh, uh, unbelievable in the Word of God, but it's here. He says, let him be accursed. Well, that's really, it's the, 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 the verb of absolute status quo, uh, I mean, plus this word. A-N-A-T-H-E-M-A. -A -A. We pronounce it and use it in the transliterated form. It's called an anathema. Anathema. Now, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek 
translation of the Hebrew. This word is consistently used for this uh, Hebrew word, which is C-H-E-R-E-M, the hard C-H, cherem. And cherem is a very, very interesting word. And probably the closest we come to it is the word accursed. But when you talk about accursed, you may think in terms of uh, uh, somebody with a little doll uh, sticking pins in it, you know, putting a curse on or someone burning a candle and uh, blowing smoke and somebody having a curse put on them. But that's not what we're talking about at all. If you'll take your Bible for a moment and turn to Leviticus chapter 27. This is a unique word in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. It's a very, very unique word. It's uh, in Leviticus 27, which is the last chapter of the book of Leviticus. The word harem is, is, is actually defined for us. It means, let me give you the meaning and let me then we'll read the verses. It means something that is consecrated to God without the capability of being ransomed. It could never be redeemed. Now, you'll see how it, it has two uh, outreaches or two uh, uh, results then. Numbers 27, I mean uh, Exodus 27, verses 28 and 29. But nothing that a man owns and devotes to the Lord, cherem, the words translated devote to the Lord is, is the word cherem, but nothing that a man de designates cherem, where man or family may be sold or redeemed, everything so devoted is most holy to the Lord. Verse 29. No per person devoted to destroy cherem may be ransomed, he must be put to death. Now, in other words, uh, there are two sides to it. Uh, either it, it belongs to God completely, or it must be destroyed. Now, the illustration for this is found in the book of Joshua. So if you'll turn to Joshua chapter 6 for a moment, perhaps you'll see how this works its way out. Now, verse chapter 6 of Joshua is the story of the city of Jericho. Jericho was the first city in the land. And uh, that was to come. All right? After they have, you know the story of Jericho. I'm not going through that. Uh, but I do want you to begin uh, with me uh, in uh, uh, verses 17 through 19. This is the, uh, the explanation. Jo Joshua 6, verses 17 to 19, 19. The city and all that is in it are to be harumed to the Lord. Only exception. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the harumed things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and the gold and the articles and bronze of iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into the treasury. That's this part. The people and the, the uh, uh, everything else is this part. There's the, there is harem and two sides of it, see? The, uh, the, and, and again down in, in verse 26. Uh, places a uh, at the time that Joshua pronounced this Alamo, Cherem before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild the city of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest, he set up its gates. And we don't have time to go into that, but uh, you have the, 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 the permanent Cherem designated for uh, Jericho. Now, chapter 7, verse 1. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the harem. And how did they do it? Well, only one. Notice, Achan, the son of Carmi, 
the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of them, the devoted things. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now, the Lord, I mean, he had made no business uh, touching it. Now, please notice in Joshua chapter 7, verse 20, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, 20 and 21, uh, Achan is caught. Uh, it, it comes out that he's the one who's responsible. And he admits it in verse 21. When I saw in the plunder that which was harmed to God, please note, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Now, see, he touched the haremed thing. Therefore, there is nothing left for him except he must be stoned to death. And uh, that's exactly what takes place in uh, verse 25 uh, and verse 26, where it says Joshua uh, uh, and all of Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned uh, the rest, they burned them. And uh, then uh, uh, they covered it over with uh, a heap of rocks. Uh, and it was ever uh, from that time on known. In other words, here was something that was so unusual, so rare, uh, that and, and so uh, important to God, that God said, uh, I, will, uh, ha I will own everything, and what I do not own is to be completely and totally and absolutely destroyed. Now, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, turn to Galatians chapter 3 for a moment. See, whatever, is, is, whatever belongs to the Lord can't be redeemed, can't be bought back. Uh, cannot be, uh, 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 could, it, it's, it's gone, it's completely gone. Now here's an application of it. Chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse, the harem of the law. How? By becoming a harem on behalf of us. You see... When, when they said himself, he cannot save, they were right. Why? Harem cannot be redeemed. There was no way he could be redeemed. He was designated harem by God. And he could not be redeemed. He could not save himself. He had to go to the cross so that we could never be caromed. Isn't that tremendous news? We'll never be harmed because he was harmed on our behalf. But God pronounces a tremendous curse, a, dis a, toast, a, a curse of utter destruction upon anyone who comes out with a false gospel of any kind. I would hate to be in their shoes. And when God says, this, he says, but even though we are a messenger from heaven, Paul writing, should we, even though we are a messenger from heaven, should announce a message of good news other than the one or contrary to the one, the message of good news we announce to you, let him be eternally condemned. He is pronouncing one of the strongest condemnations which could be placed upon anyone. And therefore, it is very, very important that the person make sure that he is very careful to give the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ correctly. Now, of course, if you're born again, you cannot lose your salvation under any circumstance. And you may apostatize, and you will therefore be under a discipline that is severe discipline in this life can't lose your salvation but it is imperative that we realize that God does not like the truth particularly the truth of the gospel tampered with he doesn't want that to take place and there is such an, a such a, a condemnation such a warning 
is just so rare to find anywhere in Scripture, just a very few places, and you see it coming out in what happened to Jericho. God said to Jericho, to the to the to Joshua through through Joshua, that Jericho will never be rebuilt. And if anybody tries to rebuild Jericho, and the historical account shows that when they did it, this is exactly what happened. That his firstborn will be killed. God would not stand for it. Jericho. The Jericho that they have today is not built on the original Jericho. The Jericho that's in Palestine today is built near to a mound which contained the original Jericho. Nothing has ever been built on Jer the old Jericho because God pronounced a perpetual curse upon that, a perpetual harem upon Jericho. As an illustration that he is the true God. And so we deal with the beautiful, wonderful, glorious good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're dealing with something that is so precious to the heart of God that we dare not ever tamper with it. Be very sure. You give out the gospel. You give it out accurately. Now thank you, for Father, for our study. May God the Holy Spirit take the things which we looked at this evening and make them a source of challenge and blessing to all of us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.